Buenos días, buenos tardes, buenos noches, como están todos. I pray that we are, that you are all doing well. It is uh, Apostle Pas Papa. Oh, I can't even talk. <laughs> it is Apostle Pastor Charlene Allen with you today and me, Evangelist Teresa Escobar. And we are on another broadcast of How I Got My Mind Back. Amen, amen, for our minds to get back to where, how God wants them to be, not how we want them to be, and not how the world wants them to be, but how God has originally made for our mind to be back in way back, 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 back. And so I'm going to pray, and once you, after I pray, you're going to hear the lovely voice of Apostle Pastor Charlene Allen, and she'll be the teaching <laughs> she sounds like an angel, doesn't she? <laughs> She'll be giving the teaching for us this morning and we'll see what God does. So let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for today. We thank you for life, for health, for breath, for movement of my of our members, Lord God. Lord, we just thank you for a new day, for the sun arose today, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord God, that you just smile upon us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that you will anoint us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. And that you, we will speak, Lord God, only what the Holy Spirit desires and wants us to speak, Lord God. Only what you have ordained for us to speak, Lord God. I pray, Father, for the listeners that they will hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to them and that they will um, react to what it is to act, uh, react to what it is you're saying to them, Lord God, and draw themselves closer to you. Lord, cover us in the blood of Jesus from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. And we cover this, um, the internet with the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for that uh, great opening. It's funny when you said, you know, something about sun rising and I look outside and it's pitch black dark. Um, sometimes that's all we do see is darkness when other people are seeing sunshine and we look out our window and we're like, it's totally, utterly darkness. That can kind of get you in a place of, of feeling hopeless and, and feeling like, how do I get out of this? This morning when I woke up, actually, it was during the sleep, my sleep, I was still asking God, like, what do you want to teach today? Because, you know, Teresa has given us a charge to, you know, give a word, a, a fresh word for, for that particular day, for this particular time. And um, I wasn't getting anything. And, and so I asked, I said, okay, give me a scripture. This just give me a scripture. And he said, John 3, 16. I'm like, oh, give me another scripture. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good scripture, but can, can I get another scripture? I've taught that so many times. And God was faithful, but then he gave me Lamentations 3 and 7. I'm like, <laughs> I started to ask for another scripture, but I said, okay, let me work with this one. And I'm going to read Lamentations 3, verses 7 to 9. And we're going to work this, this scripture. He shuts me in so I'll never get out, handcuffs my wrists, shackles my feet. Even when I cry out and plead for help, he locks my up my prayers and he throws away the key. He sets blockades with quarrelsome limestone. He's got me cornered. Now, Talk about a, dark, a place of darkness. I mean, can you imagine crying out to God and you feel like he's not only locked you up, but he's like tossed the key, he tossed it away. He, he just like, he's going to leave you there. He's going to leave you in that place of darkness. And when I read that, I was like, whoa, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> and how is that going to encourage anyone? But this particular portion of Lamentations, if you read it, I won't read it, but Lamentations 3, uh, 1 through 18 is talking about God locks me up in deep darkness. The first thing I want you to really understand is many times we're in places of darkness, we blame the devil, we blame other people, 
but we don't generally blame ourselves. It's so much easier to look out there and say it's someone else's fault. And we come up with our own conclusions why we're in this place of darkness. And God locks us up because he wants us to look up. But, but sometimes when we look up, like in this particular verse, that I cried out and plead for help, that he locks up my prayers. He locks up my prayers and throws away the key. Now, when we think about that, he locks up our prayers and he throws away the key. We say, we, we, we think that God didn't hear the prayer, but he heard the prayer, but he locked it up. It's not that he did not hear it. It's just that he's not responding to it. But when we don't get that response, we feel as if God is not listening. Well, you see, you always have to understand this. He's always there. He is a God that says he will never leave you or forsake you. It even says in Romans 8 that even in hell and utter darkness, I'm there. So the question is not if God is there. The question is, where are you? That's good. You know, if, if you're in this place where God is dealing with you and you're in a place where you are feeling hopeless, the question is, how do you find hope in a hopeless situation? So let's just first talk about this area of being locked up, your prayers being thrown out and, and being locked down and God doesn't hear. Because I know we've all felt like that. Um, what do you do? How do you handle that? How do you handle this place of darkness where God, it seems like he's like flicked you off. What do you, what do you do, Teresa? Or what are your thoughts? My, um, like you said, we tend to blame others when we're in a place like that. And we tend, we even tend to blame God, you know, because we're in a, in a state of hopelessness or darkness. And we don't look at ourselves inward to see, well, what have I done to caused me to be in this situation not in and I know it was like I was telling you before not in a selfish self-centered kind of way to look at ourselves but to look and see to look and see did I commit a sin against God is there something that I said or there's something that I done that I've done that caused him to lock up my prayers is there something that I've said or done that caused him to um you know get me in a place where I can't get out what have I done to God a lot of times we don't think about God we don't think about the things we say towards God that as if they're um people use God's name in vain people people you know say things about God and yet they still want to think that things are good to go between them and God us and God you know what I'm saying and we commit sins against God and, and um, that will keep us, that will keep God from hearing us. He hears us, but maybe it'll keep us, keep him from responding to us because there's a sin in between us. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, well, I see it. It's like a, like a, like a, a uh, what do you call that? There's a gulf between us, you know, like a big ditch and I can't get over there and he's not going to come over here until we get the matter set, settled between us and God. We have to repent. We have to ask for forgiveness. We have to see within ourselves, what did I do wrong against God or towards God or towards other people that, you know, God is not pleased with, you know, actions that we've, that we've done towards other people or things that we said towards other people. I remember there was this gentleman when I was in the Marine Corps his name, his name doesn't matter. He was my boss. And um, he was really always, he was always after me, always picking on me, always saying stuff about me. I mean, he was always hounding me, pounding me, hounding me. I never did anything right in his sight. Yet he was a Christian and I was a Christian too. But for some reason, he always was negative towards me. And I, I didn't, 
I don't know why. You know, I was like, why is this man always on me? I, I'm not, I'm trying to do everything he says. I'm, uh, I'm trying to be um, um, obedient to his commands that he asked me to do. Because, you know, in the military, they tell you what to do. And so I remember my friend, she was in the Marine Corps too, and she spoke to him and she told him, you know, you need to be mindful of, 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 of how you speak and treat other people because it will affect the relationship with the Lord. It's basically what she was telling him because he was asking the Lord for certain things and he hadn't heard anything. I'm not saying I'm anybody, you know, anybody special. I'm special to God, of course, you know, but we tend to forget how, if we treat people badly or if we sin against God in any way, God sometimes won't, he won't, won't respond to us. You know, he, he'll be quiet until we get ourselves right before God and repent and ask for forgiveness. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> well, you're telling me what you think about the text. So sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I just really think we need to look at this. We're in a day and age where people don't think about God and about sin and about things that we do. Well, there's consequences. There's consequences to things that we do to the sins that we commit. And sin is real. Sin is real, you know, and it's real to God. And it's a stench into his nostrils. And so... When you get to that place and Teresa's talking about um, what you've done, I don't think a lot of times we think about what we've done when we get into a place of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Can you remember a time when you were in a place of hopelessness and what your thought process was? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it was when I had the mental breakdown and I was like, God, where are you? Where are you? I'm by myself. What What is going on? And then all these demonic spirits seem to have infiltrated my mind and my body. And I was, I felt hopeless. You know, what did I do? What, 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 you know, I, I, I remember I was just like, God, where are you? Are you even listening to me? Do you even hear me? You know, I was, I was devastated. I was in a hopeless state. I thought I was by myself, left for not, you know, just left to to rot and, and 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 be tormented for the rest of my life. That's that's what I thought. And so you're in this place of hopelessness, and I've I've been there uh, in that place of hopelessness too. What what brought you out of the hopelessness? I pray um, God sent an, a friend of mine to look for me. And it, and she came to look for me. She said the Lord had put me upon her heart and her mind. And so she inquired of me. And she came to my house and she's like, I, the Lord put you on my heart and my mind because I just left. I just, I left. I was gone. Nobody saw me. Nobody heard from me. I was 10 days locked, not locked up, but. I thought I was 10 days locked up in, in my home. I didn't go in or out, you know, and I was going through the torment as we all know I've discussed this before. But um, yeah, he sent a friend of mine and she was like, are you okay? And that's when I was like, no, I'm not. I, it brought me out. It got, I came to myself, I guess you can say. And I think when, when you're in a place of hopelessness, I, I remember being in a place of hopelessness and that place of hopelessness took me to a bridge um, that I was going to jump off of. I left work. I had enough. I, I, I walked the little way that it would take to get to the overpass. And as I stood at that overpass, totally hopeless, waiting for a truck, like I said, like Teresa said, I've told the story before. Um, at that moment, when I'm looking for a truck to come, I hear God's voice say, I'm not done with you yet. And I'm like, <laughs> I was still hopeless when I backed away from the bridge. I still didn't know any more solutions than I had before I got to the bridge. But I had a promise. 
That was the difference. I, I had a promise. And in this particular text, if you go back down, if you read a little further, as I read this Lamentations 3, I'm like, whoa, can I get some good news for the people? Um, I'm going to read verses. Uh, let me see. 20. Uh, I'll start near verse uh, 21. I'll just read the 19 to 24. I'll never forget the trouble of the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I'll remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting rock bottom. So we both really described our rock bottom situation, our hopeless situation. And this writer also describes his hopeless situation. But one, but there's one thing I remember and remembering I keep a grip on hope. You have to have that memory. And what is that? What do you remember in that place of utter darkness, that bridge experience, that losing your mind experience, that experience when you think nothing can break through the darkness, that God is not there? What do you remember in total hopelessness? It's your memories that can bring you out. And this is what he remembered. God's loyal love could not have run out. He, it could not have run out on me. He could not have. I have to remember that God's love is there in utter darkness. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. You have to begin to prophesy and tell yourself that God's love is going to make the difference. They're created, it says, uh, they're created new every morning. His love, his mercy, his mercy is new every morning. When we first started, it was darkness. And Teresa's talking about how dark, how, you know, how we're in daylight and the sun has come. Well, I was in utter darkness. But I had to have a hope for a future that the sun is coming up. There's there's sun of coming my way. And if I just continue to wait, if I just continue to hold on, I have to understand that the world is turning and it's going to turn around. It's going to continue to move. And now, boom, light is breaking forth. A moment ago, it was darkness, but now I see light. I still don't see the sun, but I, I see light. God has a way of making light in your darkness. We have to understand and believe and have a hope that God is going to turn this around. He's going to turn it. He's going to keep moving, but I have to have a hope in him, not a hope in my situation, not a hope that if I jump off and die, that everything will be okay. Everything will be okay if I trust and believe in God's faithfulness. That's where our hope comes from. It says, how great your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over again. He's all I've got. He's all I've got left. You get to that point of hopelessness. When I lost everything, I gained everything because I held on to God. And it was in that place where I kept saying to God, well, God, you've got to figure it out. I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't know how I'm going to get a house for my kids, I, you know, because I had a foreclosure or on the house. I said, I don't know how it's going to happen. You got to figure it out. This is your problem. And I was looking for a house, looking for a house. And I said, I want that house. And I went and the house wasn't even up for say, up for a rent yet. And I kept looking and and then I said, I'm going to go after that house. I got out, went after the house and someone else got the house before me. And so I, I wasn't, I wasn't the first in line and I kept looking for the house and that house kept coming up. 
And I said, I threw the stuff down and I said, I am not looking for another house. That's my house. You got to do what it takes to get that house. I'm not looking for another house. <laughs> I totally trusted and had hope in God. Now, most people were like, oh, the house is gone. You know, that they, they already got a contract on the house. I don't care about a contract. I care about God. And you've got to do this. And lo and behold, people had dogs or something and they didn't want to do it. Bottom line is I got the house. In a place of hopelessness, in a place where I've got nothing, I, I shouldn't even qualify for a house. <laughs> I don't have credit for the house. I didn't even have money for the house. But I had God. And his faithfulness was new every morning, every morning. I stayed in that house for 10 years. And for 10 years, Teresa, that landlord never raised the rent a penny. Wow. Look at God. <laughs> Got my kids through school. Uh, God is faithful. When you don't have anything, your hope has got to be from God. In this season, where people have Christmas season, where Christmas is really more about the gifts under the tree than the gift that was nailed on the tree. I, 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 I told, I, you know, this Santa Claus that we are all, many of us were raised to believe in that this guy was flying around the world, coming down a chimney and putting gifts under a tree and you have to be nice and not naughty. Santa, if you look at the words, is a perversion of Satan. If you look at the letter, Santa is a perversion of Satan. And that's what he did to the holiday. He perverts it to make you not look at God, to make you get to a place. If you don't have the financial means and you don't have the, the wherewithal to have a house or to have uh, money to buy kid, your kid a coat or put a gift under the tree, somehow you become a failing parent. What we used to do during the holidays with our kids is we used to go to this place called Bread and Roses and we would feed the homeless. Uh, we would go out and do street ministry. That's what we did on our holiday. We gave. Um, because the birth of Christ was about a gift that was given to us. It wasn't about a gift that we give to other people. That's a perversion of the birth of Christ. My grandson asked me, we were talking, he was doing his Christmas uh, presentation. I said, do you know what Christmas is about? He's like, no. <laughs> I said, it's about Jesus. Jesus, well, Jesus wasn't actually born on Christmas. He was actually born in it <laughs> at a different time. But okay, he was born, right? Um, so let's just go with this story from the born on in in the winter um the, that's what we're celebrating we're celebrating his birth um of Jesus and and the gift that God has given to us and I just started telling them and I said okay so when somebody asks you what Christmas is about what are you going to tell them he said Jesus what are you telling your kids Christmas is about is it about the gift because that really gets you in a place of being hopeless if you can't give a gift. Now, granted, around this season, people are very giving. They, they, they want to help. I've had four people call me wanting to sponsor families for the holidays. And it quickly, I found four families <laughs> to get sponsorships because I knew they didn't have anything. And they gave me their wish list and I passed them along to the sponsors. And it's a blessing for the kids. And, and the thing that people want that have nothing, they were asking for things. And when you have a wish list, they were asking for things like gloves and socks and a coat for my kid. And yesterday I was at a Christmas party with my work and a girl came up to me and said, Charlene, do you have any people that you can sponsor? Do you still do that? And I said, I can do it if you want to. I'll find someone. 
And the person that I asked, she says, oh my gosh, this is life-changing. And she was crying. And I put the phone to the girl and I said, repeat that what you said to her. Because people need to know that giving a gift to someone you don't know, not because of a holiday, because you have a heart to give, is life-changing. See, that's where your hope is really in giving your heart. This girl gave her heart to help someone else. And when she asked, later when she was talking on the phone, I realized that she asked, what do you want? <clears throat> and the girl couldn't even think of anything that she personally wanted. She had, to, she had to think about it. And when it came down to it, what does she want? She sent me this text and said, this is what she wanted. She said, it would be so nice if I could get a candle warmer to make my house smell good. Can you imagine that, Teresa? Wow. That would make, and for her husband, she said, um, you know, he, he works outside and it would really be nice if he had a, a, a warmer to warm up his food. Simple things that we take for granted that people don't have access to. Yeah. And she thanked God for the gift. Are you thanking Santa for a gift? Are you thinking, who are you thanking for the gift of this holiday gift season? Is it a perverted Satan? Or, or is it the true gift at Christmas? See, when you have hope like the writer in Lamentations, when all you have left is Christ, oh my gosh, how great is his faithfulness. Amen. You get to the end of the line. If all you have is Christ, man, I'm telling you, you've got everything you need. You have a hope and a future. So I would challenge you when you get to a place of hopelessness where you feel like you're in, in utter darkness yeah repent for the things that you've done that's that's a step but before you get to the place of repentance you got to get to the place of remembrance mm -hmm. remembering christ remembering god and his faithfulness remember the time that he pulled you out remember 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 when you don't have it, remember, 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 God has it all. And that's what he wants us to do. I believe in this place of darkness, when he could have given me every scripture in the world, well, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. This is the greatest Christmas story of all, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever would believe would not perish. That is the Christmas story. It's a story of giving. And when you're in this place of utter hopeness, that's the place to remember. And then the gift. What do you got, Teresa? That's all I have for that. I woke up this morning with a song that the Lord gave me by Tasha Cobbs Leonard. He knows my name. Hmm. I believe the Lord gave me this song for today for this broadcast. And it goes with your message. God knows your name. No matter how dark the valley, no matter how hopeless it may be, God knows your name. And he's with you. It may not, you know, when I was going when I was going through the mental breakdown, I it felt like God wasn't there. It felt like I was all alone, that nobody care that nobody was aware but later on in hindsight the lord told me i was there all along even though you didn't go with you know you didn't you don't go by feelings you know but he told me he said later on as i was starting to get better and he started healing me and delivering me he said i was there i heard you and um uh, that and that was so precious to me to know that he was with me through what I was going through. 
And so know that God knows your name. The scripture, the Bible says he knows the very numbers of the of our hair on our head. He knows how many little hairs we have. And he knows your name. And all he wants you to do is just cry out to him. And remember the goodness of God, like the pastor was saying, remember, use your memories of your goodness. And, and David, David, the uh, the King David, when he was going through his trials with um, King Saul, he would remember the goodness of God. When Saul was trying to kill him, he would remember the goodness of God and he would encourage himself. Sometimes we don't have anybody around us and that's maybe how God wants it to be, but and that, to where he wants us to encourage ourselves in the Lord and to remember that God's mercies, um, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. This morning, his compassion is new. His mercy is new. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. And so, you know, I, I just believe that God wants you to know that he knows your name. You're not, you're not just nameless he knows your name that's all i have you know and Teresa was was talking and even me when i talk about remember there may be someone on the line on this that watches this that have no memories of god because you don't even know who he is but this is the day to make a memory yes if you're in a place of hopelessness and you you don't have anything to hold on to. You don't even know who this God is that we're talking about. This this God, this God is his name is Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He is part of a family we call the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one. That that God, that family of God is here to help you get through your time of being lost, your time of being hopeless, your time of being wherever you are. This is the day that the Lord has made for you to hear this. And, and the God that we're talking about and, and we put our faith in is Jesus Christ. He died on what this world celebrates is Easter. We also call it a uh, uh, Good Friday, right? Um, he died on that day for the sins of the world. And you're part of that world that he died for. And on the third day, which we do call Easter morning or resurrection morning, he rose and he rose with power in his hands. He rose with all power in his hands to overcome death, hell, and the grave. And he, he uh, had power to take, up his, to take up his life. He had power to do things that we, we have power to do when Christ comes in us. How does he come in us? We say, God, forgive me for my sins. I've done so much wrong that I can't even give you a list. I've trusted myself more than I trusted anyone. The pain of my past has overtaken me and I'm ready to take myself out. Forgive me for trusting me. I want to trust something else. I want to trust in someone else. And I want these, this God that these ladies are talking about. Be my God. Be my God. I want you to be my God. I want you to be real. Come into my heart and make yourself real so I can begin some memories. That's what I want. I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord. And I want you to teach me how you can be my Lord and my Savior on a day, daily basis so new mercies can come to me every day. Jesus, will you have me? And it says in Romans, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So saying, Jesus, come, 
be my be the Lord of my life. And he's faithful to hear and he's faithful to come. Now start building memories with God. Start reading your Bible. I would recommend the book of John to understand the love of God because he so loved Jesus and understanding what that love is. Read the book of Psalms to understand that in times of sorrow, you can have a song to sing. If you need wisdom, read a proverb every day, not the whole chapter, just a verse and, and get some wisdom so that you can begin to walk in the wisdom of God. Find someone that you can be held accountable to because in this life, you have to have a person to walk with. I told you that God is a family, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Even he is a three-stranded cord to make one. If the Godhead thinks it's wise to walk in a family, why don't you think it's wise for you to walk in a family? When you called on Jesus, you have now entered a new family, a new body of Christ. So get connected. If you don't, if you don't know a church, if you don't know, write us a message and we will help you find a church. We have church online. We can help you online. Everything that we do is online because we want to change the world. You don't need to ever step foot in the state that we're in because we understand this. God will step in the state that you're in and change it. So a hope in a future in Jesus Christ, just call on him and begin to make memories and he will change your very life. Let me give you one more story before we close. Talk about hope. And Teresa talked about her, her hope and a God telling her that she was okay. I remember walking down the hallway and out of nowhere, I hear God say, I was there. And it's been probably, it was 20 years, 25 years, flashed through my eyes. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. I knew exactly the moment that he was talking about. And I broke down and I said, if you were there, why didn't you stop him? I'm in work. Wasn't thinking about God, but it was his time for breakthrough. And I said, if you were there, why didn't you stop him? And then he showed me what that man wanted to do to me. And I broke down crying. And I'm like, oh my God. Sometimes that memory that you think was so horrible, God was there to stop it from being worse. And I've tapped into many people's memory, worse, horrible memories. I remember tapping into a memory of this kid. He's a man now, probably in his 30s. And I'm we're doing a deliverance session and I'm tapping into his into his past. God is allowing me to tap into his past. And he's showing me about a five or six year old boy whose father was coming after him. He was hidden in a closet. And that man wanted to ravish and rape this kid. Jesus took, stepped in and took that beating and protected this kid. And I took the kid back to that time, this man. And I was telling him what I was seeing and the man started crying. And the kid said this, I wondered why he never touched me that day. It's because Jesus took it, the touch so that the kid wouldn't be touched that day. God has a way of giving you a hope in a future. Now this kid was touched many more times and he was ravished, but that particular day, God blocked it. God steps in and blocks and he wanted that little kid to know that's a man now that I was there and I haven't left you. And this grown man, remembering that memory. And I didn't know this man when he was five, but God did and he blocks it. What has God blocked for you? That worst memory that you have? Ask God to give you a new memory of that because he was there. Why do I know that? Because his word says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Even while you were yet in sin, I died for you. 
You didn't have to know him. He already knew your name. God knows your name. Even if you don't know his, he knows your name and he loves you. Good, bad, and evil. He loves you because he knows that he can change your life and turn that frown upside down and give you a joy that surpasses understanding that is not of this world. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and surely the world will never take it away. That's the joy of Christmas. Jesus is the joy. So I pray that something that we said has changed your life, gives you a hope in this place of lamentations when all hope is gone. Let God lock up your prayers because even though those prayers were locked up, they were not thrown away. They were stored up for a time when God says, now I can answer that prayer and free you. But will you have hope in me? Because if God were to answer the prayer at that moment, your hope would be in the answered prayer and not in God. Sometimes he wants to, to have a long suffering because God is not really too interested in the healing. He's more interested in the process that you're going through to get the healing because it's in the process that relationships are built. His relationship with you is more important than your hurt. And I can tell you this for a fact why I know that's true. The relationship is more important to the hurt because do you think that Jesus wasn't hurt on that cross? He was hurting on that cross, but the relationship was worth the hurt. It's a process. Go for the relationship and stop trying to minimize the hurt. The hurt will go. But you have to have a relationship. Just remember how great is his faithfulness. God, I think you have anything else, Teresa? I saw your mouth move. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this word of giving hope to the hopeless. Your word is true. And we have to believe it and take it at face value, even if we don't understand it all. You're not trying to get our understanding. You're not trying to get our mind. You're trying to get our heart. With the heart flows the issues of life. God, I pray that this message pierce the heart of a listener so that they understand they do have a hope in a future. In this time of perverted uh, uh, season, when we see more of Satan than we do of the Savior, God, I pray that your light will shine and break forth in someone's darkness. God, I thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. And I pray right now that your presence will surround the person, surround the that him surround her with your presence so that they know that your presence is real. And God, we just release your spirit right now, the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. I pray right now that you would just consume the person under the sound of my voice, that they will feel your presence, the real presence, the manifested presence of God. Let I pray right now that you would just surround them, that you're giving them memories, Lord God, that you're healing them of, that you're giving them memories in those worst times, in those worst situations, that I am there. There's nothing to separate you from the love of God. Nothing, no high thing, no love thing, no low thing, not even hell, death, and the grave can separate you from the love of God. And God, I pray that that love is there. I pray that they understand the perfect love of God will cast out fear because fear has to do with torment and the enemy has been tormenting some people. And God, I pray that they will feel your perfect love now so that they will stand and walk in your glory and so that their story will change. God, I pray for anyone who's having a downtime during this holiday season that they will understand the true reason for the holiday is the gift that was given to them in Jesus Christ. That birth was given so that they can live and not die and see the works of God. God, I thank you. 
I thank you for the family of God. I thank you for the spirit of God. I thank you for the blessing of Jesus. And I thank you for the father who sits high and looks low that understands that even if you've never had a mother or father and they've forsaken you, that you can take them up and take them to another place. God, I thank you for this hope. I thank you for lamentations. I thank you, Father, that we will stick with God because your mercies are new every day. So today, receive God's mercy and live. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you another time on how we got our mind back. Have a hope and a future in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.